Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, a pledge from Washington, D.C. to work with tribal communities on the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women. Especially when these issues get taken up by policymakers and legislation that we remember where it started and, and where it comes from. Plus, we're one-on-one -on -one with the Democratic and Republican candidates for the first congressional district. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. State Representative Melanie Stansbury, State Senator Mark Moores, and Libertarian candidate Chris Manning had their first televised debate this week, along with Independent Aubrey Dunn. They're running to fill Deb Holland's seat in Congress. Senior producer Matt Grubbs sits down with Mr. Moores and Ms. Stansbury for a pair of in-depth conversations about their candidacies. First, this week, President Biden declared Thursday Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Awareness Day. As the new Secretary of the Interior devotes more attention and resources to the problem through the creation of a specialized unit in their Bureau of Indian Affairs. The president says all levels of government need to work together if the crisis is to come to an end. That problem was front of mind when correspondent Antonia Gonzalez spoke to two advocates who have been working hard on the problem here in New Mexico. Angel, Charlie, and Christine Means, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Hi, Antonia, thank you. Thanks for having us. And Christine, your work's personal to you, uh, advocating for your family and also working with the state on this issue. Um, we hear about all the different challenges to address the issue through a maze of jurisdictions, agencies, and governments. How was the task force able to overcome some of those barriers or break barriers? I think the task force has been really integral in connecting the different levels and layers that we have stacked up against issues of MMIW in Indian country. So they've got representation from communities off reservation, communities on Indian lands, federal, state, um, tribal. So I think that uh, bridging the communication between all of the different groups is represented. And the task force uh, issued a report recommendations after a year's work and some of those recommendations we'll get to in a, in a little while. But um, Angel, your advocacy group, advocates like yourself and also families are there to make connections, play a role working with tribes, law enforcement, policymakers. How are families and advocates changing the narrative when it comes to MMIWR? Um, I think they're the storytellers. They're the ones with the lived experience of the issue. And so um, what we do and how we work with the families um, on the issue is just like centering that, making sure that they stay fo in the focus, um, especially when these issues get taken up by policymakers and legislation that we remember where it started and, and where it comes from and, and why it matters. And uh, Christine, what do, you, what do you have to add to that? How your work that you've been doing um, all these years before even helping with the task force is changing the narrative? I think that, you know, what Angel said is absolutely correct. It's focusing on the families and the survivors, the community members who have been advocating for a long time because they are the real experts in MMIW and NMIWR. Um, so many people have been fighting for years and generations in their family, whether it's for um, policy change, justice, recognition in the media, um, you know, cases at the court tribal level. So I think it's really turning to the people who've been doing this work for a long time and making sure that they're a part of the task forces and official capacities, organizations, conferences, all of that. I think it's, it's turning to the people who've been experiencing this, this firsthand. And the task force did release uh, findings and recommendations late last year to the governor and state lawmakers. Some of those uh, recommendations include the need for more resources uh, for data collection because there are a number of cases that go unreported and are unknown. And Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, recently announced the creation of a missing unit to help address this uh, on the national level and also 
which will trickle down to the local level. Christine, what does that mean receiving resources and even just attention on the federal level? What does that do? You know, I think it elevates the voice. It elevates stories. It elevates the work that people are doing. It amplifies the voices of organizations like the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. It, it, it elevates the voices of the task force because so much of this work has to happen on every level. So we can do the work in the communities. We need to be doing the work in our own families, in our own homes. But then we have the people who are advocating for us at the organizational level, nonprofit fundraising. Then we go to tribal, state and federal. And without that national voice and that representation, I think we're all you know, working so hard, but also maybe duplicating the work. So I think um, having somebody who can help streamline the focus and maybe help figure out where it is we need more support on that national level, but also gaining the support of people who are not familiar with MMIW is so important in the work. So I think the her establishment of it and making it such a priority in her first weeks, you know, as Secretary of the Interior shows such a big opportunity for everybody at every level. So whether you're currently going through it right now as a family, you're working with somebody who's maybe just come home, you're advocating for a bill, it just, it kind of grounds it and it gives a foundation of, of like, we're, we're, the work we're doing is heard and other people are fighting at all different levels. And Angel, how important is that for organizations like yours to have that federal attention and maybe be able to um, interact and get some resources from the federal government and working with um, even Secretary Holland herself or some of her staff members. Uh, how is working with the federal government uh, trickle down to local communities and being more than just a lip service from the government? Um, well, I, that's a great question. I was reading an article early this morning about um, when Operation Lady Justice was first established, I think they had a budget of $1 million. And, the um, new unit is has an allocation of six million. And so they're putting real money resources into the issue. It also really helps that um, on the federal level is where those gaps are, right? That these departments don't speak to one another, DOI, DOJ. Um, and to have someone like Secretary Holland in that position to coordinate um, the units is gonna be really helpful. Uh, we're one of 19 tribal coalitions throughout the country, so we serve New Mexico and kind of the Southwest region, um, but our sister agencies have been taking on the issue for a really long time, um, and we, we do policy advocacy, um, systems change work, but it's been hard for us to figure out where to put the issue of MMIW, right? Federal funding is very specific on what you can and cannot advocate for. And so for years, we've been trying to figure out how do we make this fit into our programming? How do we justify the issue? And for us as an organization, um, we've leaned into it through our sex trafficking program. Um, so, so it's really been sustained there and our sex trafficking coordinator um, has led the work for the organization for a really long time. But I think what this also gets to do is um, name it as its own issue. So we don't have to keep trying to make it fit in the other area um, issues. And then, yeah, just back to that, this, it's gonna have real resources. So, so we do hope that that trickles down and that um, this very specific issue gets to be addressed. And just looking at all the different issues and challenges it, when it comes to addressing uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and relatives, there's also on top of that, the pandemic. And Angel, um, you're hosting a session with uh, some tribal leaders uh, talking about domestic violence and this issue and just also how communities have been impacted, especially in rural areas with domestic violence when it comes to the pandemic. What does that look like in tribal communities? Um, well, that's what we're gonna listen to the advocates for. So, so we have uh, several panels where we have people who've been working on the front line um, this past year tell us like what happened, what worked, what didn't work, what were some of the challenges, what were some of those barriers? 
and really get to hear from them, like what maybe some of those curfew orders that are still in place right now for tribal community, um, how those might have impacted um, seeking shelter or needing to leave the community um, if, if you were experiencing domestic violence. And so um, we're using it as an opportunity to, to build back our systems a little better. This was a great opportunity to learn in a crisis moment um, what worked and how we can sustain that going forward. And Christine, that's also something the task force examined um, through the year. And also, I'm sure it, it also had challenges for task force members in working on uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and relatives. Yeah, I think that the initial planning of the task force was going to be very hands-on, which is how it was started. Public meetings, they wanted to, the task force members wanted to go to communities and have forums where people could come in and talk and give their experience. And I was able to attend um, their first public meeting here in Albuquerque. And then uh, when the new year started in COVID, it really slowed the momentum. So uh, the public meetings turned to, to Zoom, which for a portion of the population was okay because we have internet access, we're able to get on. But I know it, it stopped that communication line with a lot of people in communities who maybe didn't have internet or just could not get to a computer that day. And, um, you know, to participate in Zoom, which is another issue we have is the, the access to internet in rural communities and then in some native communities. So that was an issue. And it was just something that was all we could do was push through and continue to host Zoom meetings. What do you hope happens with the task force in the future? The task force today is in their last few months of the official appointment time. So when they were appointed um, in the original House bill, the task force was set to uh, expire, sunset, end on June 30th, 2021. So right now the official task force is in the last couple months of meeting, of convening, of trying to accomplish what it is they set out to do. And a big part of that was the report in publishing it. And then after that was proposing a bill, which there was a bill proposed in the legislative session, um, March, 2021. The House bill didn't go through, unfortunately, but they've pivoted and decided to propose an executive order to the New Mexico governor in its place. And that would ensure that a task force could continue on moving forward into 2022. And I think the, the overall goal really is to find that long-term solution, that long-term support of what it is that the task force's role is in the state of New Mexico. What is the role that it plays with tribes, with the New Mexico Indian Affairs Department, with this, the government of the state of New Mexico? So I think that um, in the initial year of findings, something, some recommendations were able to come out of it. And now it's it's prioritizing those action items and starting to to put them into effect so that they can be enacted. And Angel, what are your coalition's plans for the future? What's in store for this year for the coalition? Uh, well, in terms of MMIW, I think we're really starting to explore some of the root causes. Um, so why does it feel safer maybe to leave your home than to stay in the community? And so we'll, we'll be taking a really intentional direction toward um, getting at, at that root cause um, and developing training around that. But, um, you know, the entire year we have events planned. Uh, this month is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I just stepped out of a training to join you here today. Um, where we joined with the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. We also have an, a 5K in November. Um, we have a Native Youth Summit where last night was the first day of the last cohort. Um, and so tons of events, ways to get involved um, and stay engaged. It's on our website. So if folks um, want to wanna check out what we're doing and join us, we, we invite you to. Well, thank you both for your work and your advocacy on this issue. And thank you for joining us here today on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you, Antonio. On June 1st, voters in the 1st Congressional District will decide who should replace Deb Holland. Balloting is already underway and expanded early voting starts May 15th. The Republican candidate is State Senator Mark Moores. As Albuquerque has grown more Democratic, he's hung on to his Northeast Heights District seat. 
Mr. Morris owns a medical testing lab, but he's been in politics for decades, serving as chief of staff to former Lieutenant Governor Walter Bradley. He spoke with senior producer Matt Grubbs about his priorities, his take on intra-party differences, and what role crime should play in the agenda of a U.S. congressman. Senator Mark Morris, good to see you. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you, Matt. Great to see you. Absolutely. So let's start with policing. <laughs> right uh, off the bat. Right, exactly. It's kind of a weird one, right? Because um, you're running for Congress. Yep. Policing is usually a local issue. Um, but let's talk a little bit about qualified immunity. That's Correct. something that New Mexico has recently addressed. Um, what are your feelings on that? Is, is getting rid of it as a defense a good thing? No, it's not. And I voted against that in uh, Santa Fe as a state senator. And I'll vote against repealing qualified immunity for law enforcement officers uh, in Washington. You know, I think we're all incredibly concerned and have, we have woken up as a country about some of the needs for reform with law enforcement. But you know what has really it's concerned me, Matt, is this vilification of law officers. Um, what we need to do is we need to stand by them. You know, my opponent says the system is broken and we need to scrap the entire system. And that's not true. We need to stand by the law enforcement officers by giving them the training that they need to help serve us better. Also make sure they have the technology and the equipment that they need to serve us and protect our, st our states. But what, what concerns me with the qualified immunity is that what, what we're having is a situation where law enforcement officers have to pause. They need to be able to react in situations that are life endangering. And if they stop and they have to think about that and that pause leads to the death of a citizen or even their death, that is very concerning. It can be very, very dangerous that my opponent actually supports. And right now you're seeing a huge reduction in morale in law enforcement. I've talked to officers who uh, have worked for many, many years, and they're wondering why a young officer or a young person would even come into the profession right now. So we cannot vilify the men and women in blue. We need to help them. We need good training, we need good equipment, and we need to be able to move forward and help them. Because you know what, Matt? As you well know, every day we, see, we wake up here in central New Mexico and there seems to be another murder. I think there's about 45 so far this year alone. Uh, and that is about uh, twice of what the previous record was for this time of year. It's out of control. This epidemic is out of control. We don't need to defund the police. We don't need to eliminate the police. We don't need radical reform like my opponent wants. What we need to do is actually support and stand by them. And we need to work to make sure bad officers get off the force. No question. But we also need to make sure those officers who are there to protect us have our support, including training and equipment. There's a, there's a lot to dig into there. Um, as we speak, uh, the independent monitor has come out with his, his most recent report, and it says essentially that, uh, look, um, you have the policies in place. You know, for the past three reports, you've been totally compliant with, with these policies, um, and you're doing okay at training, but that's starting to slack off. And then the real issue is that the department isn't taking these reforms that they entered into with the Department of Justice. The police aren't taking those to heart. Um, and, and it's almost a culture issue. Uh, how do you see um, your ability to, to leverage change in that? Do you see that as an issue? It's definitely an issue. And that's where I think we need that, report, uh, that reform, not the radical destruction of the system that my opponent supports. We need that training in the sport. And that's something that the federal government can provide without the heavy handedness of the Department of Justice. You know, I met with the uh, Police Officers Association. They told me that 60 officers are off the street right now just doing paperwork. At a time where crime is through the roof, and murders are through the roof right now. We're taking 60 law enforcement officers off the streets to do paperwork. We need training, we need support, we need technology, but we need to have common sense about this, especially with crime out of control right now. Do you feel like the Justice Department should allow the Albuquerque Police Department out of the court approved settlement agreement right I now? I do, because right now we're in crisis. Albuquerque is burning, and it seems like the politicians are playing the fiddle. And we got to be able to deal with this criminal 
element that has just taken over the city right now. Um, and we have to be able to address that right now. Or, you know, we're not going to have economic development. We're not going to have new jobs here in town. Uh, we're going to see this continuation of this brain drain that we see in New Mexico as our young people move. We saw incredible stagnation this last 10 years of population growth. And that's a number of factors, and part of that is the out-of-control crime that's happening in central New Mexico. As families and businesses are looking, where are we going to go? Are they really going to go to New Mexico where every morning you wake up and you see a new murder happen within our town and the schools are underperforming and job opportunities for their children aren't here? So that is part of what is happening, and crime is a huge central part of that. Um, your critics are going to say, if we go back to the way it was before without having completed the reforms, we're going to go back to a system in which um, bad cops, and you've mentioned they exist, um, they were costing the city tens of millions of dollars in settlements. Um, there were um, huge demonstrations in cities on the East Coast with a six million dollar settlement, yeah. I can think of in Baltimore. Um, we were outpacing that by many, many times. Is that really the system you want to go back to? We need reform. We, ne we know we need improvements in the system. We don't need to scrap the system and destroy the system, as my opponent is calling for. Um, we need to reprove it. We need to get the bad cops and have that oversight off the street. But we also need to give them support, the technology, and what they need to do their job. We can't vilify the men and women who are coming in to protect us and going into dangerous situations and expect them to be there when, they, uh, when we are in trouble. Who's going to show up for murders and rape investigations if we just drive all the cops and consider the cops the bad guys? Um, you've, you talked a little bit about your opponent and you've, you've used the word radical to describe her. Um, the idea um, that we need to reform the system um, in a broad way, um, that, that does feel radical to you when it comes to public safety and, and policing? We need to reform the system. The, my opponent is radical because she has said that we need to pass the BREATHE Act. And I encourage the, list of the viewers to go to breatheact.org and look at what she's proposing at. It is the complete destruction of the law enforcement system. Her proposal, according to their own website, eliminates the police, prison, and all punishment paradigm. That's their words. It is completely defunding federal institutions like the DEA. ICE, the Border Patrol, task force, including the FBI uh, Terrorism Task Force. The bill she supports takes away federal funding for bulletproof armor for police officers. It even goes as far as saying drug-sniffing dogs cannot be allowed in federal agencies anymore. Who believes that is not a radical agenda? In fact, Matt, that bill says Federal law enforcement officers cannot go within a thousand feet of a school or a bus stop. How is that making sense? Who is the criminal that her radical proposal that she supports in that situation? She's saying that police officers, federal law enforcement officers can't go near a school. Which federal law enforcement officers? It's in the bill. In, Breathe is it, Act org. Is it, it immigration? Says, no, because it's there might all, be an argument. It says that. federal the bill says federal law enforcement officers on Breathe Act. And who believes that makes sense? Who is the criminal in that situation where sexual predators are being treated the same as law enforcement officers? And that's just a radical, radical agenda. Um, you've worked with some Democrats in the legislature who are, um, you know, they're, they're left-leaning Democrats. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking of like Matthew McQueen, Andrea Romero. Good friends. Um, Jeff Steinborn. Mo Maestas, are, all good friends. Are they radical? Um, I believe so. And, but, you know, I think that's what's important. You bring up a very good point. Uh, that you can have different opinions in the legislature and we deal with some very important passionate issues that you have to have those differences opinion but 90 percent my experience dealing with Santa Fe and my experience in government is that 90 percent of what we do has to be able to work together you have to be able to sit down and take like bills like I've talked about and some of the uh, good friends I have on the other side who have very strong 
opinions about on issues, but then work together on all those other issues. Because our republic does not work if we're always fighting. Now, we have to fight and we have to have those debates on these big issues. But all that list of people that you just said, good friends of mine, we have very different opinions on some big policy issues, but I strive to actually work with them on areas where we can work together. And that's one of my strengths, I believe, as a senator. Uh, I fight for my conservative values, but I also know that I need to work together with the other side on those, that, that critical issues that we need to advance in New Mexico and the nation. And I'll do that in Washington. I can, I can hear viewers um, shouting at their screens right now saying <laughs> that's not how it works in Washington. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to be how it works in Washington. If you win, most of your colleagues will have voted to not recognize the election. You know, it's, that's, a, that's a, sticky, um, a sticky issue. Do you feel like there is any question as to um, whether the results of the 2020 presidential election were legitimate? You, you said that's not the way it's been working in Washington, and you're absolutely right. Both parties are at fault for that issue, and it's been going on for too long. I have prided myself to actually work with the other side. I actually make it a point every year to find a piece of legislation in Santa Fe that can be bipartisan, including some of the legislation of uh, um, people that you talked about earlier. This last year I did redistricting reform with one of the most liberal uh, state senators, Gerald Ortiz Pino, and we were successful working with a bipartisan, bicameral legislation. Um, so to answer your question, we're a republic. We have elections. Joe Biden is the president. I didn't vote for him, uh, and I will, I'm not happy about that. But we have to honor our constitutional republic. This amazing American experiment is about 240 years old, Mouse Metals, and we need to make sure it continues for another 240 years. We have elections. They have consequences. We moved on as a nation. If we don't and we continue this, uh, this bickering back and forth and we refuse to work together, I fear that in 240 years we won't have a republic, if not sooner. Yeah, it <clears throat> certainly feels shaky at times. Um, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit um, about tax structure and this idea of, of radicalism. It seems kind of radical that the biggest companies and the wealthiest citizens don't pay very much in tax. Um, these are positions that the Republican Party has supported. Does that feel radical to you? The, I'm a small business owner. We're in health care. And so we actually have to recruit doctors, highly skilled medical uh, uh, professionals here to the state of New Mexico. People who can actually do diagnosis of testing and medical exams. And people who diagnose cancers, they are actually, it's very, very difficult to recruit them if we're not competitive. And we're not competitive when they look at the, we're looking at histotechs and lab techs who are making six figures. Uh, and uh, they can go to Arizona, Texas, other states around the Southwest or anywhere really in the country. And so since New Mexico is not competitive, we have a much more difficult time recruiting. So we have to be competitive uh, nationally and internationally. So the idea of raising the corporate uh, income tax uh, nationally, then then putting and making us one of the most highly taxed countries in the world, puts us at a uh, competitive disadvantage, especially at a time where we need to be bringing that manufacturing base back to America. Again, I was in the healthcare field. I was in the front lines of the fight against COVID. I personally put on PPE every morning and went out there and collected COVID tests myself and put my health and safety online. And what COVID, the COVID taught us is that we have outsourced way too much manufacturing. All of our PPE, as you remember, uh, was, was very, we had to find. Now you see how big I am. Try finding PPE to fit me during the middle of a pandemic. Um, but on a serious note, it was difficult. We had to protect our staff and had to protect the people of New Mexico. Um, and, but we didn't have that manufacturing at the beginning of the pandemic. We have an instrument that is a quarter million dollar instrument that allowed us to do COVID testing that we use for viral testing in the laboratory. That instrument's made overseas. And for the rest of the pandemic, we only had that one instrument. We could have put three or four more instruments in use, but we couldn't get them because the manufacturing wasn't available. So we could have helped much more if we had been able to have that manufacturing here in America. And quite frankly, that instrument took a beating uh, and there was a lot of maintenance issues as we moved forward so that we, um, we could have actually helped New Mexico a lot more if that manufacturing was here in America. And so that's an example of why we cannot be the highest 
rate taxed country in the world. But we have not. to be, well, we're not right now, but the proposal would go to the, be one of the highest rated in the world. So that's why I think we're, if we look at the industrialized countries, we're about middle right now. And that's probably where we need to be to be competitive uh, because there are a lot of advantages for corporations to be in America, no question about it. We're the most powerful, successful economy in the history has ever seen. Um, but by making us less competitive and giving incentives for corporations to move overseas, when we need to be bringing that back here to America, because as COVID proved, we need that manufacturing here in the United States of America. Um, because quite frankly, Matt, there is going to be another pandemic. My grandfather became an orphan because of the Spanish flu a uh, hundred years ago. And here we go hundred years later. And with globalization the way it is right now, the next pandemic hopefully won't be for another hundred years, but let's be realistic. The viruses will change. There will be a new virus and we'll have to be prepared as a nation and a world for the next pandemic. Sure, it's a, it's a national security issue. Um, you mentioned redistricting. I do want to get to that. We got about five minutes left here and so much to, to cover. Um, uh, the idea that elections have consequences, certainly. Um, in 2010, um, Republicans had Project Red Map, which was the idea was to redistrict as many Republican seats as, as they could. Um, now Democrats are in control. Um, I'm not sure, can you, can you blame them for not wanting, you know, the, the Speaker of the House, Brian Egolf, was sort of resistant to this idea of a redistricting commission, um, which you did get passed in some form. Um, but can you blame them for saying like, well, wait a second, it's our turn, elections do have consequences? That's the problem with politics and redistricting right now, because that's what happens every 10 years. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It is about our fundamental democracy and our republic. And that's where redistricting has always been in New Mexico. It has been that blood sport of legislators protecting their own districts and incumbents drawing their districts and taking their house and drawing their districts around and uh, themselves to protect themselves. In New Mexico, it was literally a process of incumbents picking their voters as opposed to voters picking their legislature. And that's a Republican and Democrat issue. Uh, it's, it's, not here, it's not one or the other is better or worse because it is an exercise in raw political power. And it's also an exercise in caucus control. The leaders of the caucuses love drawing their uh, potential opponents for leadership out of their districts. <laughs> so it is not a Republican Democrat issue. It is about just raw power. And so the importance of having a bipartisan, bicameral redistricting commission that I worked on for a number of years, and you and I have talked about many a times, was very important for the fundamentals of our republic and our democracy to make sure that people were able to elect their representatives as opposed to the representatives picking their people. And I'm very proud of that bill. We were, I mentioned earlier, I worked with some of the most liberal members of the state senate and bipartisan group. Uh, and. Uh, um, uh, members of the House of Representatives, it took a team effort to break up that cabal of power. So I'm really excited about the redistricting reform that's happened. I don't believe it went far enough. I would like a constitutional amendment to mandate that uh, Independent Redistricting Commission is the ultimate arbitrator on picking out what, who, what maps there are. But the, what we did this year in a bipartisan, bicameral way really moved the ball forward. Okay, about 90 seconds left. Um, Climate change, um, how serious an issue is it right now? There's no question that we have to change our energy sources moving forward uh, from, from nuclear. Wind and solar are huge in New Mexico. You look at the economic development of wind uh, mills, like say in Torrance County in 1st Congressional District, hugely important for the ranchers out there and also for the school districts and the local community tax base that don't have oil and gas. But we also in New Mexico have one of the most vibrant oil and gas industries that have 134,000 jobs. And so it's foolish of us to scrap that like my opponent wants to do and put those people out of work immediately. We need to transition. We are going to transition eventually, but we need to also make sure we're protecting New Mexico because who is going to get rid of that 40% of the revenue the oil and gas industry brings to the state of New Mexico for capital outlay, for police officers, for our schools. Without that resource, New Mexico is even worse off than we are now. So it is foolish to actually cut off that huge opportunity for New Mexico to invest in itself for the future as we transition to new energy sources. 
Uh, lastly, and really quick, we just have a few seconds left. Um, both you and your opponent have run um, attack ads. They're a fact of life, a fact of campaigning. Um, she has, in fact, uh, run a bill that um, would lower income tax for, for senior citizens um, uh, who are collecting social security. She signed a bill that would do that. And but she didn't do anything. She didn't do anything during the pandemic. That was 2020. Uh, her, her her party is in full control of the state legislature. They passed every one of their agenda items this last year that they wanted to. And when it came down to protecting seniors, she was nowhere to be found. I stood up on the Senate floor during the tax bill and ran an amendment. And the ironic thing, when I ran that amendment, all the Democrat senators who had signed on as sponsors to that bill. They voted no. They had the power to protect our seniors as a gov in control of the governorship, the House, and the Senate by almost two to one margins. They passed every one of their agenda items. So what they said is, we're going to sign this bill, but it's not really our agenda, and we're not going to really do this. That's what politicians do, not leaders. So what you need to do is actually when you say something, you do it. You just don't put your name on a piece of legislation and say you do something. Because I think that's what New Mexicans are tired of. It's politicians serving themselves, not the people of New Mexico. Mark Morris, we're out of time, but we thank you for yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Voters in the June 1st special election to replace Deb Holland will see not just Mark Moore's name on the ballot, but Libertarian Chris Manning and former Land Commissioner Aubrey Dunn as well. The Democratic candidate is Melanie Stansbury. She's a state representative from Albuquerque's Mid Heights. Prior to being elected in 2018, she worked as a U.S. Senate staffer for the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and in the Office of Management and Budget for President Obama. She sat down with NMAF senior producer Matt Grubbs to talk about what she'd like to do in Congress, how the national conversation about police reform impacts New Mexico, and what role border politics plays in a central New Mexico congressional district. Representative Melanie Stansbury, thanks for spending some time with us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Great. Well, um, I'd like to start with, with criminal justice. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the middle of a national conversation on policing. You haven't been shy about uh, engaging with it. Um, everyone is clear about Albuquerque's, um, at least the depth of the crime problem in mm -hmm. Albuquerque when it comes to violent crime. Um, as a congresswoman, how do you see yourself impacting Albuquerque crime? Yeah, well, as you just said, you know, we are in the middle of a national conversation around criminal justice reform and policing reform. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that the system is really broken, that people are literally dying and that we have serious and systemic issues with our policing and criminal justice system at the same time that we also have crime problems in the Albuquerque metro area. So I believe strongly that we have to address our safety, our public safety issues by investing in smart crime fighting technology, by ensuring that we have sufficient numbers of public safety officers and that they have good training to do community policing and the tools and resources to be able to address those issues. So as a legislator, I've been serving since 2019 and I've spent a lot of my time there helping to coordinate the city's uh, capital outlay program around public safety. Safety. And in doing that, we've been able to bring home literally tens of millions of dollars in public safety funding, which is the largest amount of public safety funding ever in our history to come home to Albuquerque from the legislature. So that's for things like gunshot detection and addressing violent crime. But it's also clear, you know, that the, when you talk to public safety officers and our chief of police, that the, you know, underlying reasons why we have so much crime in Albuquerque are really related to our economy and our behavioral health crisis, especially drug use and, and you know, crimes associated with drug use and, and drug trafficking. So we really need to rebuild our behavioral health programs. We need to be providing more economic opportunities and fixing our schools and improving education. And we need to be reforming policing. And so as a Congresswoman, you know, in terms of police reform, I strongly support passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, ending qualified immunity at the federal level, addressing the systemic issues around policing and our criminal justice system, but also ensuring that we're bringing resources home for supporting behavioral health, economic development, and education as well. 
Okay. Those are issues that are, um, that are addressed broadly in the BREATHE Act, which mm -hmm. is something that you've expressed support for. You spent a lot of time defending yourself against it in the, in the KOB debate this week, and I'm certain it'll come up in the other mm -hmm. two that you have. Um, what do you like about that? What seems to fit about that piece of legislation? So I think that what is really critical is that we have a national conversation about police reform. And the BREATHE Act right now is a concept, it's a you know omnibus of legislation of criminal justice reforms. And you know I think that we have to have this conversation around policing and systemic racism and addressing the system. But ultimately at the end of the day, you know whatever legislation comes before Congress, we'll need to make sure that it's implementable that um, our communities are able to have the tools and resources they need to keep uh, our communities safe. And you know, I just wanna say on a personal note, having grown up here in Albuquerque and having family members who have intersected with the policing and criminal justice system because they were struggling with addiction, we have to make investments in our behavioral health system. And you know, I'm just gonna keep beating that drum over and over again because our community well-being is at the heart of addressing our crime problems and we have to address those issues. If you look at, um, at the Breathe Act, it seems to incentivize uh, moving towards some of those things. Um, is that part of the structure that you like? In, in other words, it would, um, if you do certain things in terms of funding the police, it would um, provide grants to do things like address homelessness, behavioral health. Is that what makes it attractive? So, as I said, we need to be addressing police reform in America. I am interested in supporting and empowering and centering our communities in that conversation and considering any kind of legislation that will help to address not only our crime epidemic, but to address the systemic racism that is you know, built into our very broken criminal justice system. So I think we need to be having these conversations at a national level, and we need to make sure that our communities are at the center of those conversations and helping to craft the outcomes. Um, a term that's come up in that conversation is defund the police. Uh, it means different things to different people. As you understand it, or as you interpret it, uh, what does it mean? Does that term hold value for you? I think that the term itself is a term that has become extremely problematic politically. And when you look at polling around the term itself, there are people on all sides of the ideological spectrum and who think about these issues that don't like the phrase, right? Because ultimately, if the goal of investing in our communities uh, which is what a lot of the conversation is centered around, right? Investing in education, behavioral health, and those kinds of things is the ultimate goal. Then, you know, it seems like the language should be about investing in our communities, not necessarily divesting from public safety. But um, I think strongly here in Albuquerque, we have to do both. We have to invest in community based police reforms and uh, public safety, and we have to be investing in our communities. So we need to be doing both at the same time. Um, the Department of Justice is here as part of a court uh, agreed settlement agreement or uh, court administered settlement agreement. Um, the monitor, independent monitor, just came out with another report and it doesn't show things getting better in terms of the department embracing some of these reforms. The policies are in place, but the training is starting to lack and um, perhaps maybe the culture at APD is um, resistant to that change. Do you see um, a reason for the Department of Justice to still be here? Or do you think that it's, it's time for them to go after being here since you know, late 2014? I think it's really important that we kind of look at the bigger structural issues around public safety, resources, funding, and staffing in the city of Albuquerque to contextualize what's happening around our police force. When you talk to our police chief and folks who've been around for a long time, you know, one of the things that they will point to is that we're severely understaffed. Like for example, up where I live, up in the foothills, our local area command, we have, you know, officers who are working 
double or triple the normal shifts they should be working because there are literally not enough officers in um, our, our police force. And part of that is that we are one of the lowest paying um, police forces in the country. And, um, and so we have some structural issues around recruitment, retention, training. And I think there's a lot of work being done right now to change the training model of our police force and change the culture. But part of that is we have to be sufficiently staffed. We need to make sure that we have smart tools and technologies. But also, yes, we do have to be addressing, you know, that there has been an overuse of force in our in our local policing and that it has led to the deaths of a number of people in our community. So I think that you can reform the culture and provide the appropriate resources to address our public safety needs and still have appropriate oversight to ensure that people's civil and human rights are being protected at the same time. So I think that we need all of the above to address our, our challenges. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, border issues, obviously you're, we're not a border district in CD1, um, but it's, it's right next door and really it's kind of hard to separate in, in many ways people's lived experiences. Um, from that, your approach, as I understand it, is somewhat similar uh, to criminal justice in that it looks at, at the system and perhaps um, working on some of the things that are uh, causing people to leave their homes and try to come to the U.S. Um, there are a number of ways to get at this, but I guess first, let's talk about security. Is there a border security crisis or is the crisis in the arrival of, of migrants? I'm going to turn your framing on its head because I think the crisis is a human and economic security crisis. You know, we have places in North and South America where there's tremendous amount of, you know, economic insecurity, drought, and other things that are happening in communities. And um, we are seeing the arrival of thousands of people who are fleeing economic or violent or, you know, um, drought issues in their home countries and truly I believe that the best security is addressing the security of our hemisphere in terms of human rights and economic security. So the kinds of investments that we see our president and vice president working on to ensure that we're providing humanitarian and economic aid to those places and to the people there. But the reality of the situation is that literally thousands of people are showing up at our border seeking asylum people who've traveled hundreds of miles on foot and thousands of children arriving without their parents. And so, you know, it is incumbent, I believe, on our country to address the humanitarian needs of people seeking asylum on our border through that humanitarian lens. Um, what does that mean in terms of a, a now fix? Is that doing things like adding more federal judges um, adding more administrative positions, adding more border patrol um, agents, you know, what feels to you like a, a good step forward right now? In terms of next steps, I think that, you know, there's a lot of work being done currently by the administration to figure out how to best help and secure, you know, the human rights of people who are arriving and to help them get wherever, you know, ultimately um, they're trying to go. But I think it's a resources issue. You know, I used to work, uh, we were talking before we started here, as a budget analyst in the White House Budget Office. And when you don't have sufficient resources to help address, you know, especially a huge increase in whatever activities, and in this case, people arriving at the border, then it's really a resources issue. And so I think it's really critical that we address that. I think, um, you know, there are also legal issues around how people are, are moving through the court system and the asylum system that clearly need fixing and ultimately we need to be putting into place a fair and equitable and just um, asylum system so that people can you know come here safely seek asylum and have due process um, how quickly should that due process happen are we talking six months two years what feels just to you I think that as quickly as we can ensure that people are safe and that their rights, civil and human, are protected and, and people can get on with living their lives. Okay. Um, 
you know, we have a lot of the same issues here in, in New Mexico, but also in the U.S. You know, we have communities that are suffering from um, poverty, from drought, that sort of thing. We struggle to fix those issues here. Is necessarily, you know, giving money to Honduras or, or Guatemala, is that a realistic fix? So it's, I think it's really important that these questions don't get posed as an either or because it's the wrong way to look at it. I mean, ultimately, the security of our country and the human well-being of the planet and people across the world is a question both of sort of national security, economic security, human rights, and the United States as a you know, global citizen. What is our role in the world? And I would like to think that our role is to be a good global citizen, to be a humanitarian citizen, and to also take care of our people. And I think that we are a prosperous country. I think we have the resources and the tools to help our people prosper, both in our own borders as well as people who are suffering in other places. And I think that we have to do both. Okay. I know climate change is very important to mm -hmm. you. Um, the energy part of that, how does New Mexico um, walk that fine line um, between realizing that the extractive industry means so much to the state budget, as you well know, uh, but also knowing that um, it contributes to climate change? Um, that's sort of undeniable. That doesn't stop folks from denying it, but, but the science is pretty clear. How do we walk that line um, between recognizing that this is vital to the state budget and um, shifting away from it um, and not hurting those communities that rely on it? Yeah, so um, as I'm sure you're aware, I've worked in the sciences most of my career, and I work at the sort of translational space between the physical sciences and the social sciences and policy, and I work specifically on climate change and drought issues. And so how to understand what the physical science is telling us about what climate change is doing, and then how do we plan for those impacts and adjust. And since I've been serving in the legislature since 2019, I've sponsored climate legislation every single session. So to address climate change, we have to address our greenhouse gas footprint. So that's, you know, the, the greenhouse gases that are being emitted by all different sectors of our society. We need to address the impacts that are already here because the science is clear. We're already experiencing fires and droughts because of the changes that are occurring. And we need to diversify our economies and especially in the communities where, um, you know, industries may be shifting as a result of our ultimate economic and um, environmental goals. So, um, so kind of taking it as a whole picture, you know, ultimately how do we get to carbon neutral is what our goal is with respect to addressing the climate crisis. And you can do that through a combination of technology um, by capturing, you know, greenhouse gases and in various industrial and other processes, switching to zero carbon utilities and cars and things like that, bringing more renewables online and carbon sequestration. And New Mexico actually has a huge potential to be a giant carbon sink as we reforest northern New Mexico in particular. So ultimately, I think the question needs to be, how do we get to a carbon neutral future in New Mexico? And it'll probably be a combination of all of those things that I just talked about. But I do think that, you know, we, we're seeing this with the Energy Transition Act that passed in 2019, that um, there are impacts to communities as we go to carbon zero. And, um, you know, I've shared this story in many places. I was born in Farmington, I grew up here in Albuquerque, but my mom actually worked at the San Juan power plant, which is the power plant that is currently undergoing closures as PNM is making this zero carbon transition. And the truth is those are good union paying jobs in especially rural communities. And so how do you make that economic transition? And to me, the answer is you need to empower communities to really reimagine their economic futures. So you have to give them tools and resources and economic planning um, opportunities for communities to really think about well, what are the industries that would work here and how would we build those out over time? Now, how does that impact the budget? Ultimately, we have to grow and diversify our economy overall to make up for any lost revenue that we might have as this big transition is happening. And, you know, New Mexico has a number of hugely 
burgeoning industries where I think we have the opportunity to really lean in. So our science and technology community, you know, we have our national labs and our Air Force research labs and all of that. So doing more tech transfer, we've got a high tech industry, entertainment, um, you know, agriculture, I, there's the arts, you know, I think there's a lot of amazing places where we can really grow and diversify our economy long term and we have to do both the short term and the long term work to get there. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, it, from a federal perspective, does that look like um, writing uh, taxation frameworks that would favor those industries or that would help those, those industries along? Um, does it look like grants? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, so this last legislative session, um, I worked on a bill with my um, co-sponsor, Representative Angelica Rubio, um, to do all three of those things. So to address our greenhouse gas footprint, to address the impacts of climate change, and to um, diversify our economy. And it includes kind of convening all the stakeholders, including industry and frontline communities and workers, to come up with new ideas for the economy. It includes bringing grants, resources, science. We need science. And, um, and it includes creating sort of the framework within which you get to net zero. So that includes providing statutory frameworks that drive our country towards a net zero outcome in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And how you get there, ultimately I think Americans are hugely innovative, you know, and I, I strongly believe that we will get to a net zero future in the next couple of decades. Um, and we just have to provide all of the support and frameworks to our industries to get there and, and invest in our green energy economy. We have uh, less than a minute left, but I wanted to talk, as I spoke with your opponent, about negative ads. They're mm -hmm. a fact of life in, in running. Um, one of yours um, focuses on uh, uh, Senator Moore's and says that, quote, he opposed every measure to help people during the pandemic. Um, that's kind of provably false. Uh, why choose to go there? So I think that... Um you know, unfortunately, uh, right out of the gate several weeks ago, um, the negative ads started being lodged in our direction, which were just completely factually untrue. And I think our response was to ask a very serious question, which is, why would, you know, the primary Republican um, nominee oppose federal relief at the same time that he was taking it? And I think that's a question that voters really need to think about. And um, because at the end of the day, one of the most important things that whoever goes to Congress is going to do is to help our communities get through the pandemic. And so we need somebody who's going to go to Washington to fight for infrastructure, fight for federal dollars, to make sure there's money in the pockets of hardworking New Mexicans and ensure that at the end of the day, there's somebody serving who knows our communities, who knows the science and is going to look out for our best interests. And that's why I'm running. And I believe that it's absolutely critical that we elect someone who really is going to look out for the best interests of our community. Representative Stansbury, we're out of time, but we thank you for yours. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be here. As I mentioned earlier, Chris Manning and Aubrey Dunn will be on the ballot as Libertarian and Independent candidates, respectively. We'll have their links to their campaigns on our show website. Now, for the first time this weekend, Bernalillo, Sandoval, Doña Ana, and Santa Fe counties are all turquoise, which means this weekend we move to 75% capacity in restaurants and most outdoor areas. Hair salons get to 75% as well, and mass gatherings go from 20 to 150. It's a big difference. Now, this past weekend, the rail yards market opened, bees are in the air, and it all feels so freeing, doesn't it? I'm grateful, I'm sure you are as well. But there is this still continuing issue of vaccinations and the willing, or more accurately, the unwilling, and what that means for the rest of us. You may have seen in the paper that the University of New Mexico is considering requiring students and staff to be vaccinated to return to campus this fall. And UNM isn't the first and will not be the last institution to wrestle with this collision of where personal freedoms intersect with the responsibility to keep staff and students safe. Now, what's your opinion? I would love to hear your thoughts on this one. And the best place for that is the Focus on New Mexico Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us, for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus.
Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.